Good afternoon, my colleagues and uh, students, and also distinguished uh, invitees. This is again a very important moment for us. Uh, we are having a special lecture by our mentor, Professor MD Nalapat. Many of you know about him, I'm sure, because he is, uh, I don't know, regular contributor in almost at 10 different places in, the, in our country as well as elsewhere in the world. But let me briefly tell about Professor Nalpat because he has been mentoring us at this department. He has started this Department of Geopolitics and International Relations way back in the year 1999 with uh, a very major objective of understanding the complexities of the world system by having track to dialogues. As you know, track to dialogues is very important to understand each other's perception. And he's perhaps one of the very few in our country who was able to bring uh, all the top key members of academic and policy community to this, to this campus. So people from Israel, United States, China, various other parts of the world, they had come here at the department and they have had very uh, good discussion which provided certain in input to the key policy community in our context. And it was his vision that we started this teaching department, that master's program uh, in geopolitics and international relations in the year 2010 because he had a very, I don't know, uh, he basically wanted to see that how the younger generation also gets oriented towards this area. It's very important for a country of this size where we need to, in fact, have a number of good specialists working on the various geopolitical regions of the world. And that was the objective on which he basically, uh, obviously, motivated us to start this Department of Geopolitics and International Relations. As you know, this uh, 10th batch has joined this year. Sir, I am very delighted to inform you that this time we got 25 uh, students from almost uh, all parts of the country. In fact, we have a student from, uh, in fact, uh, Jammu also. We have a student from, uh, in fact, almost all the states, if you see their uh, background and the place where they have come from, very prestigious institutions they belong to. And uh, we, were, we had tough time in terms of selecting. You could have taken around 40, but we didn't want to increase that number to that level. And uh, <coughs> they have come with a very uh, definite objective, especially uh, in terms of seeing that how uh, they become a good analyst as well as some of them want to also uh, join civil services to become Indian Foreign Service officers. So in fact, uh, th this is what this whole department uh, in fact strives to achieve that, that how best we can orient these young minds and in a modest way we have been doing that in the last 10 years. Professor Nalpat basically has uh, always been a keen contributor on a number of pertinent strategic issues and he's again perhaps one of the very few who writes uh, both for the Pakistani newspaper and also our uh, Indian newspaper, more particularly uh, in organizer. And that again is not that easy to do that because he is a person who, uh, in fact, uh, fine tune his ideas in a very balanced manner. And this is how the things basically uh, are known to the people about his ideas. In fact, when I was doing a master's from JNU way back in the later part of 80s, we used to wait for his column. That time he was uh, the editor of Times of India and he, we used to, he used to write once in a week the top article and we used to wait for his column because his columns were very much, I don't know, not only in terms of learning but also in terms of new ideas that how best India can perceive those aspects of international relations were being uh, understood by those uh, readings. And we certainly, I personally have learned a lot of things from his uh, write-ups and obviously in fact those of you who have been following his write-ups uh, in the whole week, I think you will know that he basically uh, encompasses uh, in every area, whether it is to do with the domestic politics, to do with the larger global politics, or to do with any particular geopolitical reason, his uh, ideas always are very much uh, counted as well as accepted by the academic and the key policy community. Sir, we are very delighted to have you here, sir. I know you have uh, had your very busy schedule, but he accepted uh, our invitation because this department belongs to him only. Obviously, he has to accept that, and uh, he basically also accepted to deliver a lecture on a theme which is again very important as you know the debate slowly and steadily has started. How best uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir can get integrated with Indian Union and that is what perhaps is going to be a logical next step. And he was very <coughs> keen to really share his ideas on this very complex topic because this is something which again has started among the key policy community in terms of uh, identifying the larger debate uh, whether it is to do with the defense minister statement or to do with the other home minister statement, this is coming up, uh, in fact, that how, in fact, India has to discuss only about Pakistan occupied Kashmir with, uh, with Pakistan. In fact, India is no more interested in talking about Jammu and Kashmir with Pakistan. 
India wants to talk only on Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So I think this topic certainly from a geopolitics point of view is very important. The rest of the world has been noticing this development with a lot of keenness and the type of mobilization of international public opinion which India has been able to do this time again is very phenomenal. I think <coughs> Pakistan in real sense uh, has been isolated and uh, if you see the whole committee of nations, the way they are coming up in a big way in terms of supporting India's cause. And that perhaps will provide a certain good uh, way to understand India's motivations to integrate Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Anyway, I don't want to in fact talk on that because I don't know very little about Pakistan occupied Kashmir. But obviously through him will all of us will learn. I now request our mentor, Professor M.D. Nalpath, to deliver his lecture on integrating Pakistan occupied Kashmir with the rest of India as the next logical step. Please join me in welcoming Professor M.D. Nalpath. Thank you, Arvind. I just want to say that uh, after we set up our department, and I would like to say it was the wisdom of uh, Dr. Ramdas Pai, uh, the then Vice Chancellor, Dr. Valiathan, that India needed to focus on geopolitics. We were a big country without a strategy. George Stanham, I mean, who Arvind knew well and was a good friend of mine, he used to always say that India is the only major country without a real strategic policy. And that, in a large sense, was true because we used to get by on emotion. We used to get by on basically uh, day by day or month by month kind of issues. And very often, the leadership looked at issues from the point of view of other countries, how to make their uh, situation better rather than focusing on our country. And we missed a lot of opportunities in the 1950s, the 1960s, 70s, 80s. I mean, you, a lot of opportunities were missed in a period where a country has to grab whatever opportunity it has if it needs to do well. So it was the vision of, frankly, Chancellor Ramdas Pai and then Vice Chancellor Valiathan that we department was set up. After that, of course, it took a little bit of time before I could decide on who was the best person to head the Department of Geopolitics. And after spending time at various institutions and being part of various institutions, including the National Institute of Advanced Study, NIAS, I came across a young man there who was silently working in NIAS and frankly doing a lot of work which others used to claim credit for. Uh, several of the important conferences were actually organized by him. A lot of the talks and discussions were done through him. And I felt that this is the kind of person we need to bring into Manipal because what will happen is he will do a great job and I will get the credit for it. So, so that, that individual was actually Professor Arvind Kumar. And I'd like to say that, uh, you know, Arvind, over the years, uh, the, each batch of our department has done well because our intention was, if you go to London, you know from the UK point of view what is important. You go to the US, you know from the US point of view what's important. If you go to China, there's no way you'll get any other point of view other than the Chinese view. I mean, they're very clear on that. Hardly anybody used to talk about the India view if at all we had an India view. And I, we wanted this department to be on the India view as a future superpower, as a major power, as an aspiring great power. At that point in time in 1998, uh, I remember in the 1990s, which Arvind was talking about, the late 80s, when I used to write about India becoming a future major power, people used to laugh and say, well, it's never going to happen. Then in the 90s, I started talking about India as you know, one of the real big global powers. People used to laugh. But today, it's become a reality. You know, we are there. Among, we are there with the United States, with China. We are there in the top three tier in terms of purchasing power parity. We are also now there in the top four, along with Russia, in terms of technology. So we have reached that stage. And we need dedicated people who understand our needs, who understand the ground reality, who understand the world around us. And the intention behind this particular course was to educate them in the ground realities of India and its situation so that we try and avoid some of the mistakes made in the past and mistakes of lost opportunities and mistakes of bad policy. So I think, you know, uh, over the years, the batches that we have turned out have done well, 
And I think, if I may say so, I congratulate you on the exceptional way in which you have internalized and absorbed uh, these situations because the, the good news is that given good policy, there is nothing that can stop our country from going ahead in a way which is, I mean, consonant with the values, principles, etc., which the entire global community believes in. Now, I was going to talk about the Pakistan occupied Kashmir. I, I've been writing a great deal about 370, and those of you who have been following my writing will know that I was not an admirer of 370. And the reason for that is I'm not an admirer of partition. I think that the Congress leadership, the Mahatma Gandhi in particular, made it its life's mission to prevent partition. He made it its life's mission to ensure that the normal thing happened and that Hindus and Muslims could live at peace with each other and that, that the two-nation theory would be debunked. Now, the two-nation theory says that Hindus are Hindus, Muslims are Muslims, the two can never meet, which is absurd because we are both part of the same DNA uh, uh, or, you know, of, of, the, uh, of the civilization of India. And if you go back to what I, mean, what I call Hindutva, our DNA has a very significant Vedic component. It's got a very significant Mughal component. It's got a very significant Western component. All three components are part of our DNA. And so, therefore, to speak of Hindus and Muslims being two nations, which unfortunately was the theory behind partition and the theory which has uh, led to the, the setting up of the, of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, which is frankly Islamic in name only. It should be called the Wahhabi Republic of Pakistan. Uh, uh, it's not, not the Islamic Republic. But why we were talking in terms of, for example, going in Kashmir? In my view, uh, I mean, you know, we, there was an alliance with the PDP. Again, from day one, I opposed that alliance. In the past, when it was mentioned to me that there could be an alliance, I used to oppose it. Unfortunately, the government of Prime, um, went ahead during this alliance. It proved to be a disaster. And finally, in 2018, I think that alliance was abolished. That was the beginning of the change in policy towards Jammu and Kashmir. Because much of these alliances, the Article 370, these articles, Article 35 is basically an anti-lady uh, article. It's an anti-gender article. It's nothing to do so much with religion as with gender and with uh, ethnicity and with region. But 370 was based on the two-nation theory. And it's quite extraordinary that we had something like 370 based on the two-nation theory in a country which has been split by the two-nation theory which has seen enormous bloodshed during that period because of the two-nation theory, you have an Article 370 which was grounded in the two-nation theory. Because what does Article 370 say? It says that if you're a Muslim-majority state, you should be treated differently from states having a Christian majority or a Hindu majority or any other kind of majority or in the, you know, if you look at Ladakh, for example, a Buddhist majority. You, I mean, which is absurd. Uh, whether you're Hindu or Muslim or Christian or Sikh or Jain or an atheist, I mean, I don't see any reason why you should be treated differently in a secular state. So 370 was based on the proposition that if you're a Muslim majority state, you are totally different from the rest of the country, which is not Muslim majority in any of the other states. And you should be treated differently. And secondly, that you know, a lot of restrictions should be put from those who are coming from outside. They're not allowed to buy property. They're not allowed to do this. And in fact, women of Kashmir who marry outside Kashmir are not allowed to consider themselves Kashmiris at all. They have no rights out of 35A and various other things. So in my opinion, now this was done in good intentions with, by Jawaharlal Nehru. Jawaharlal Nehru was an extraordinary person a brilliant person. He's written some of the most powerful essays on colonialism, one of the most, some of the most prescient articles about the interwar period. But, you know, somehow the fact is he was worried that after going through this terrible trauma of partition, and frankly, even Mahatma Gandhi 
one of the greatest human beings who ever walked the earth as einstein said you know and in times to come people will scarce believe that such a man in flesh and blood ever walked upon this earth uh, gandhi ji was of that thing that people would scarce believe that you had a mahatma gandhi walking upon this earth and he failed he failed in preventing partition which was his single biggest objective freedom was not the objective because after the 20 after the first world war britain was anyway a declining power and by the end of the second world war there was absolutely no way the british could have held the indian empire together especially because the indian army the indian armed forces and the indian navy in particular was in a state of revolt and without the help of the indian army and the indian navy there was no way the british could have held india so essentially the dawning of the consciousness of the need for freedom in the indian armed forces made it inevitable that the british would have to leave and if you look at some of the papers in london some of the atlee's documents churchill the messages you will see that this was the the factual situation is not there in our history books because our history books are like a basically much of our history books are like a, a, a bollywood movies you know it's a very pleasant it's lovely to watch it's great fun to watch and it's always usually a happy ending but uh, it may not really conform to reality but uh, anyway that's history and hopefully that will be changed sometime in the future but what i want to say is that a conscious decision was taken by pandit nehru that we must treat the largest minority as somehow different from the majority and have laws and procedures specific to them so that the sense of difference that created partition is somehow ended by continuing that sense of difference that created partition now this is the leap into logic which frankly uh, my brain is too small to understand but I, in my view it was a disaster because we needed to integrate hindus and muslims together we needed to make them know that we are one country one people and in also let us be blunt one culture you know and unfortunately 370 was the living testament of the two nation theory and it was all those who died during partition all those who suffered during partition all those who have suffered as a result of the artificially created conflicts between hindus and muslims and of these conflicts about 99% are basically wahhabi and hindu they are not sunni and hindu they are not shia and hindu almost i mean i have tracked uh, communal violence so called hindu muslim violence from 1953 55 onwards up to around the middle of the 1990s and there were only three or four instances of shia hindu violence three or four instances among i'm sorry to say thousands of instances almost all of them were based on this fanatic fringe of wahhabism which i don't consider to be part of islam at all frankly and today even the saudis agree and crown prince of saudi arabia salman uh, you know is definitely uh, working very hard Uh, Mohammed bin Salman is working hard to ensure that this uh, Wahhabism is no longer, you know, uh, supported by the Saudi state, and thank God for that. But what I want to say is that PDP as a party, I mean, I have met PDP people in Qatar, I met them in Saudi Arabia, I met them in UAE, I met them in the United States, and wherever they went, the they had the same message. kashmiris are suffering we need to be free please help us and how do you help us by giving money to to me and to others and to others to x y z who are from the pdp so they used to always go asking for money you know write your checks save kashmir by writing the checks give freedom to kashmir by writing big checks and if you write very very big checks then you're doing the greatest a benefit actually this i mean i was surprised that the bjp would have an alliance with a party like this whom i have seen across the world asking for money basically to keep kashmir separate from the rest of india but the bjp went ahead with that alliance so in my view i think you know prime minister modi is an extremely practical and shrewd human being a very practical person the sunday guardian which is why the sunday guardian carried a, a 20 plus 20 page 
issue specifically devoted to how he is a, a, a brilliant administrator and basically saying that, look, this would be a fantastic leader for India, which is true. But, uh, but fortunately, I think he understood that this was a bad alliance, that you know, whatever advice he was given was not the right advice. So I trace the beginning of a realistic policy towards Kashmir, a policy that treats Hindus and Muslims as the same, a policy which run, goes away from the two-nation theory as being the break between BJP and PDP, and then beginning on now, the latest manifestation is the end of Article 370, which is an article grounded and anchored in the two-nation theory. If you believe in Article 370, and this is what I am very surprised, many of my friends who are not in any sense, you know, uh, anti-Hindus uh, and Muslims coming together, who are very, uh, you know, secular, so to speak, they are all fanatically standing up for 370 without realizing Article 370 is the very opposite of secularism. Secularism means equal treatment of all faiths. Secularism means people of all religions are the same, which is true. We are all human beings and we are all children of the same Almighty. Every one of us is the child of the same Almighty. Secularism means that. It does not mean having a separate law for a state just because that is the only state in India which is a Muslim majority. In my view, Article 370 and the treatment given to the state of Jammu and Kashmir exacerbated and, you know, and increased whatever uh, uh, the distance there was between two communities, individuals in two communities, who need to work smoothly together for the prosperity of India, for the prosperity of our subcontinent, for the prosperity of the globe. So I was very happy about Article 370 uh, being removed. And as I said, those who track my writing will find out that for a, quite a considerable period of time, I, was, I have been writing against this PDP alliance, against Article 370, and basically from the, from the 1980s onwards, against this two-nation theory of Hindus and Muslims being different from each other and needing to be treated differently, when in my view, they are, there is no difference, no real core difference between a Hindu and a Muslim and a Sikh and a, you know, and a Jain, because as I said, we are all children of the same almighty force. Now, this is a continuum. When you begin a progression, like for example, when you begin to bring up a child, when you begin to, uh, to launch your academic studies, it is a progression that needs to take you from one achievement to the other, from one milestone to the other. In a sense, it's like a rocket, you know, uh, one stage is removed, next stage comes in. One stage is removed, the next stage comes in. And if you see that movie on, I think on, it's called Mangalyan or something like that, so, ma ma Mangal Mission, whatever it is, uh, you'll see how the different stages operate and finally you have a successful launch into whatever the trajectory you're supposed to have. So, in that sense, you know, this is the removal of Article 370 and the complete integration of whatever is left of Jammu and Kashmir after the 1948 uh, ceasefire and after the fact that we lost a huge amount of territory to the Chinese without even realizing we had lost it until we lost it, whatever is left of that is fully integrated into the Union of India. Because may I remind you, it is not the Federation of India. It is the Union of India, just as it is the United States of America. And it is because it was the United States of America that Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln, went into a civil war to protect the country from separation. Uh, if, for example, it was, you know, federal states of America, there was be not so much of a, of, a, of a justification maybe for a civil war. But Abraham Lincoln, who was a man of peace, had no compunction in going in for a civil war that lasted four or five years and cost really huge suffering to keep his country united. Of course, uh, I mean, when you have China, for example, when the Communist Party took over in 1949, they very soon marched into Tibet. 
they marched into manchuria they marched into in mongolia they marched into uh, xinjiang now these territories were really hardly part of the territories managed by uh, you know the previous chinese kings or emperors and all that for a very long time but they marched into all that cuz they wanted to keep a big a great china a united china and abraham lincoln said it is my duty to keep the united states of america united unfortunately in 1947 uh, i mean the choice made by india and the leadership in india was different okay we accept division of india we accept partition of india and therefore the country became partition apart from the fact that we took over from the british and during the time the british ruled india myanmar what is now myanmar was very much a part of that construct sri lanka was a part of that construct the maldives were a part of that construct afghanistan was very sig significantly a part of that construct they were i mean you know and if you look at the middle east much of the gulf countries the indian rupee was actually the the medium of exchange in that part of the world in southeast asia also the influence of delhi Uh, was extremely high so there was a huge footprint so frankly we didn't inherit the we didn't take over from the shoes of the british we chopped those shoes in half and we are using those half chopped shoes uh, frankly while claiming that we stepped into the shoes of the british raj in 1947 by just locating the headquarters of india in lutians delhi that's a big difference between locating a headquarters and thinking the way the the british did when they formed their empire i'm not saying we should go into that colonial mode i am only saying whether it's the time of chandragupta maurya whether it's the time of emperor ashoka whether it's the time of emperor akbar this was a great country and i only like to say that the you know the that kind of thinking now today again we are now moving into an age in which if uh, economic policies of the current government become slightly better and again if you read my articles i have been saying for the last 5 years that the economic policies are completely unfortunate and that we have largely continued mr chidambaram's policies and now that chidambaram is in jail hopefully the finance ministry will will stop continuing some of his policies and will go in for better policies and we'll have a double digit rate of growth which is what we need but what i'm trying to say very clearly is i have this vision of belonging to a country with an ancient and great civilization i have this vision of belonging to a country that's among the great powers of the world in fact among the three great powers of the world the united states china india followed by uh, russia which unfortunately is very way back and brazil which is even more way back uh, than than <coughs> russia is but at least these three countries are not way back and even today they are today three of the most important countries on the globe if you look at it that way then what happened in 1947 which is basically abandoning pok was a huge strategic mistake now the reason for that was essential and that is that the british just did not trust the leadership the congress leadership in india to take care of the interests of the western alliance they just did not trust them and they trusted mr jinna much more now that is grounded in the fact that uh, from 1939 when the first world war uh, when second world war started uh, the leadership in india the congress leadership took a neutral position in 1942 mahatma gandhi called for quit india at that point in time it was not certain that japan would not come and conquer large parts of india japan was had taken over burma and at the gates of assam frankly when it was stopped but there was a, every expectation japan may take over india so at that point in time mahatma gandhi said quit india and at that point in time 1939 mohammad ali jinnah said i love you winston churchill i love you you know atli i love you britain and you and uh, um, the muslim league will 100% support the allied war effort against germany and japan we are 100% with you not 99.99 but 100% with you of course do us a little bit of a favor and cut this nation up 
and into India and Pakistan, but we are with you. So you have on the one hand a party which says we are 100% with you in a war in which you are fighting for your life. And you have a party which says we are neutral, a party which I must again uh, reiterate, led by some very outstanding people, very saintly people, very brilliant people. But, I mean, you know, in London, from the time India and the Indian, that is the Congress leadership announced neutrality in 1939, from that time, and especially after 1942, when frankly the Japanese were at the gates, and an ultimatum was given to the British, get out now. You know, when the war against Japan was going on, the Japanese were at the gates, and the British and the American armies were fighting the Japanese, along with, if I may say so, millions of Indian soldiers. That was when Pakistan became an inevitability in London. And that was when, from that time onwards, the British worked to create Pakistan. And circumstances were created, together with the Muslim League, and if I may say so, some of the policy decisions taken by the Congress leadership, which ensured the breakup of India. Why I'm saying all this is, the idea behind geopolitics is to ensure not breakups, not weakening of a country, but consolidation and strengthening of a country. That is the purpose of geopolitics. That is the purpose of policy. And that should be the purpose of policy. And a scientific study of how we can do that is very essential. If you look back in the past, you will see why George Stanham said that India doesn't have a strategy. And why Chancellor Pai and, uh, and Vice Chancellor Valiathan said, look, this is not going to, we are both very proud Indians. Both Chancellor Pai and Vice Chancellor Valiathan could have become a citizen of any country in the world. I mean, they would have been welcome, but they have remained Indian citizens, proud Indian citizens, because they love this country. And they said that this is not going to work. We need, we need a, a, a geopolitical vision. We need a strategic vision. And let, let's have, well, let's begin that process in Manipal. And they did begin that process. So I was appointed the, the, the country's first professor of geopolitics. Now, in fact, I think there are lots of professors of geopolitics, including in our department, but also in other parts of the country. But uh, at that point in time, this was definitely a, a very visionary step. And I really even now salute uh, you know, Vice Chancellor Valiathan and Chancellor Pai for that vision. Now, let's go back to uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. In the first place, there was no call for that ceasefire. It was unfortunate. We could have taken back. For the simple reason that I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to protest at, the, at uh, what you have put up on the board. But if you had put up a map of, uh, in, of, of you know, of India and Pakistan on the board showing P, okay, it might have been a little more helpful to my talk. But I simply want to say that the importance of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir is that was our gateway to Central Asia. That was our gateway to Afghanistan. Now that. Pakistan was formed. POK was the Indian gateway to Central Asia and to Afghanistan. And Central Asia and Afghanistan are key theaters for India in terms of geopolitical advantage. And above all, in this global war against fanaticism, against extremism in any part of the world, it was very, very important. So unless we get back POK, frankly, we are unlikely to have the kind of influence in Central Asia and Afghanistan that would be good for the people of Central Asia and Afghanistan. We have, of course, Chabahar uh, in Iran. And I have been arguing very strongly that we should not uh, stop buying oil from Iran. Unfortunately, uh, we stopped buying oil from Iran. Since then, I have been very clear that we should resume buying of oil from Iran because otherwise, I, I, in my view, we will lose Chabahar to China. So China will have Gwadar, which incidentally was offered to India, was offered to Pandit Nehru uh, by the Sultan of Oman. I think for $1 million, he offered it. And uh, for some reason, Prime Minister Nehru consulted, I don't know who, and they said, no, 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 we're not interested in Gwadar, it's too far away, it's some desolate territory, we don't need Gwadar. And so Mr. Jinnah bought it for $2 million. 
uh, I mean, we, we were offered for one million. Sultan of Oman sold it to Mr. Jinnah for two million because at that time Oman had a very major stake in in Balochistan. If you go back to the history books, this is not really written in our history because, like I said, our history as it is written is largely Bollywood history. It's a feel-good history, which makes us all feel good and makes us all believe that everything was perfect. It's but if everything was so perfect, how are things so awful? Uh, I mean, after things were perfect. You know, that's a question which, I mean, neither Bollywood nor our history books have been able to answer. But what I want to say is that the Chinese will then get control of Chabahar. Again, some of us have pointed this out in detail. And therefore, we were, we were very keen that we should uh, be friendly with Iran. There's another reason why we should be friendly with Iran. Of course, there are multiple reasons why we should be friendly with Iran. I'm not going to go into that there. But there's another reason why we should be friendly with Iran. And that is... We cannot take over Pakistan-occupied Kashmir on our own. Let's be honest. India is not a big economy. If you look at the Chinese economy of 12 trillion, if you look at the US economy, which is uh, several trillion dollars more, our less than our, we are, we are less than three trillion dollars. We are not a major economy as yet. We will be a major economy if we grow in double digit for a generation, we'll be a superpower. But we have to grow up in double digit for a generation for that. And at present, frankly, we are not a very impressive economy. We have among the lowest per capita income standards in the world, very frankly. So there's very little to, frankly, go home and be cheerful about so far as the size of our economy is concerned. We cannot do this alone. We can do this only if three or four conditions are met. And as you know, for everything, conditions have to be met. If you need to get good grades, you need to work hard, you need to do various things, you know the conditions. If you need to get POK back, certain conditions are needed. One of the conditions is we have to have America and Afghanistan as our allies in this effort. It cannot be done only by India. It has got to be a joint operation of Afghanistan India and the United States. In this joint operation, we need the goodwill of Iran. Not just the neutrality of Iran, but the active goodwill of Iran for the simple reason that, you know, Iranian uh, territory, etc., is, will be very important for various aspects of such an operation. And which is again why, in my view, you know, the fact that we stopped buying oil from Iran because uh, uh, President Trump gave us some kind of a threat. Frankly, this is not the sign of a confident power. I did not expect the government of India, frankly, to behave like Tony Blair in the face of George W. Bush and just surrender to uh, U.S. sanctions and stop buying oil from Iran. I'm a little disappointed that this happened. But because, again, from the point of view of POK, we need the goodwill of Iran very clearly. And also, we need to convince the Chinese to keep out of that war. We need to do that. And I think we have got a very good weapon to do that. And that is the fact that China needs the Indian market significantly and substantially. The, especially now when you have this trade war with the United States going on from 2018 onwards. And President Trump has for the first time in the history of the United States after Harry Truman gone against China. No other American president has gone against China. And some American presidents like Carter and, Lin and, and Clinton were very pro-China, extremely pro-China. They helped China enormously. Even Ronald Reagan was uh, very helpful to China. President Trump is the one president who has basically acted in a manner which is not helpful to China at all. But that creates an opportunity for India. The fact that Americans are now on the war path makes our friendly relations with India even more important for China. The fact that Americans are on the war path means that they need our market and our future market much more than in a situation where the Americans had basically, like what Clinton did, 
Clinton removed the MFN condition. Otherwise, there was a condition that every year there had to be a certification that China was obeying human rights, etc. Mr. Clinton did away with that. He was, as I said, among the most pro-China individuals uh, you know, on the planet. His wife, Hillary Clinton, was smarter. She spoke against China and acted in favor of China. So everybody, uh, everybody heard what she said. Everybody read what she wrote and so oh, this lady is anti-China and nobody looked at what she did, which was extremely pro-China. So the Clintons were extremely pro-China and, and I would like to say I don't blame them. Chinese are a wonderful people, great culture, great country. And the Chinese Communist Party has built China into a superpower. It has done an enormous amount of good work. So from, again from that point of view, we have our market and therefore, in my view, that card is a card that needs to be played that look if you start helping pakistan if we have, once we move into pok then the indian market is no longer there for you in fact even after this un meeting in which they opened up kashmir and they tried to have a formal un meeting on kashmir after 50 years luckily there was no formal meeting there was no statement there was nothing except a press conference by the chinese and the pakistanis even after that, in my view, some punishment needs to be meted out to China. And that can only be in the sphere of trade. Whether it is concerning individual Chinese products or companies or something, something has to be done to show China that, look, there will be a pushback, there will be a blowback to this kind of behavior. I have not seen that particular blowback or pushback. And I would like to say that I am a person who is likes China, who goes frequently to China, and who would like to see a good relationship with China. But that good relationship has to be based on mutual respect. And no country will respect another country that just refuses to do anything when that country is pushed around, pushed around, pushed around. And we were very badly pushed around in this UN thing. And I think some action needed to be taken. But provided action does get taken, provided our comment that look our market will be shut is a credible comment and they don't believe that this is just a lot of hot air which is what they believe a lot of Indian politicians say pure hot air without meaning anything then I do believe the Chinese are not going to get and at the same time that their access to the CPEC will be protected which I think no harm in, in us doing that the CPEC will go through POK I don't believe the Chinese will be likely to intervene in that conflict. If we play our cards right, they will not intervene. Among the most important reasons why they will not intervene is if we have a security alliance with the United States. You know, uh, I was uh, uh, pretty young at that time. In fact, possibly younger than you guys are there now. My grandfather was, uh, I mean, knew Prime Minister Mrs. Gandhi quite well knew many of the, her people very well and they were all nice to him because Mrs. Gandhi liked him. And you know that when the Prime Minister likes you, a lot of people like you. And the Prime Minister doesn't like you, a lot of people dislike you. I mean, that's what happens in, you know, in India or in Delhi. So a lot of people liked my grandfather and there was a very, a very brilliant Kashmiri in Mrs. Gandhi's group called D.P. Dhar, Durga Prasad Dhar. And it was D.P. Dhar, actually, who was the architect of the 1971 Treaty of Peace, Friendship, Cooperation. I mean, I forget the name. Now that you can Google it, there's no reason to remember very much anyway. But that particular thing, D.P. was the architect. I used to hang around my grandfather when he used to go for some of these meetings, you know, tag along. And he, and he, he had a meeting with D.P. about this particular uh, treaty. And my grandfather, being staunch backer of Nehruvian and Gandhi and this thing, said, what are you doing? How can you have an alliance with the Soviet Union? We are a peace-loving country. We are a non-aligned country. He said, you know, sir, I want to tell you one thing. What is going on in East Pakistan is intolerable for humanity. We have got to intervene in East Pakistan and ensure that this intolerable genocide is stopped. If we intervene, the Americans and the Chinese will come charging through our borders. The only way to keep them away 
is to have a formal alliance with the Soviet Union. If we have that particular monster at the gate, no American or Chinese is going to dare walk into our yard. I remember those words very clearly. They were expressed back in those days, which is, I mean, way before any of you were born, possibly before some of your parents were born, I don't know. But the reality is, frankly, that he was right. Because of the Indo-Soviet Treaty, the Americans and the Chinese fumed and fretted. You had Nixon sending the Seventh Fleet, the Russians sent the Sixth Fleet. And the Sixth Fleet had nuclear weapons, the Seventh Fleet had nuclear weapons, the Seventh Fleet went back. The Russians also went back. And as for the Chinese, they looked at the Russian border, and it's a big border. They looked at Russian troops, they looked at Russian nuclear weapons and missiles, and they wisely decided that apart from a few very strong statements, and the good news is that, you know, they are as good at strong statements as we are. In India, we have, we have a practice of, you know, we have very strong statements about ISIS, uh, about so many other things. We give the strongest possible statements. And the Chinese gave some very strong statements about India in Bangladesh, but not a single Chinese soldier crossed that particular uh, border, and not a single Chinese bullet was fired into India. The Pakistanis were on their own, despite having been promised by the United States and China. The United States, Kissinger told them, don't worry, we have got a promise to the Chinese that they will come and we will help the Chinese. We won't do it because all these Democrats like India so much and too many of our Republican friends like India. So we, we won't do it directly, but we'll help the Chinese to do it. So that's what Mr. Kissinger did. He helped, he said, we'll, and they encouraged the Chinese to do it. Kept on, in fact, throughout that conflict, kept on reminding China, what happened, what happened, why aren't you moving? And the Chinese said, yes, yes, tomorrow, day after, day, day after, we'll move. And all the time praying that India goes and takes over Dhaka quickly so that they don't have to have that pressure. But the reality is the Indo-Soviet Treaty kept the Chinese and the Americans out. A defense relationship with the United States will keep the Chinese out of any movement towards uh, POK. So the reason for an, a U.S. alliance is the same as the reason for a Soviet alliance in that day. Let's not forget, times change, you know, situations change. In those days, Russia was anti-China, believe it or not, extremely anti-China. In fact, there were frequent clashes, uh, you know, across the Usuri and various other places. In those days, Russia, of course, was very anti-America. I mean, there's no question about it. And these are the two countries that were going to invade on behalf of Pakistan. Today, Russia is the strongest ally of China. In fact, you know, we're talking about the S-400. We're talking about buying the S-400. I'm opposed to it strongly. The Russian, uh, the Chinese and the Pakistanis are having an Air Force drill. In that Air Force drill, the Chinese are learning about the American aircraft that the Pakistanis are using and how to fight them in case they have to fight the Taiwanese, who use the same aircraft, by the way. So if there's a war with Taiwan, the exercises with Pakistan, with F-16s, will be very helpful to the Chinese in learning how to face the F-16s. And the exercises with China will be very helpful to Pakistan in learning how to outwit the S-400 radar. Because the Chinese are deploying the S-400 radar in this particular tactical exercise. So in that situation, today's Russia is joined at the hip by, with China. China is joined at the hip with Pakistan. And if these two countries are joined to China, then obviously they are joined to each other. Which is why now you have Russian arms sales to Pakistan. You have Russian military uh, maneuvers taking place with the Pakistan army because any ally of China is ipso facto an ally of Pakistan. So you're not going to get Russia to help you in taking over uh, this thing. The Russians are going to instead help the Chinese. Who will then help the Pakistanis? This is the ground reality. And yet, frankly, we, make, we made a huge mistake in not buying oil from Iran. We made a second big mistake in going for S-400 because if you have the S-400, it is incompatible with signing a robust security alliance with the United States. 
It simply can't happen. For a simple reason that the S-400, once it is deployed, every single facet of any combat aircraft will then be visible to Russian radar. And the S-400, incidentally, will be manned by Russians. It's not going to be manned by Indians. It will be manned by Russians. We'll be handling some nuts and bolts kind of thing, moving it, you know, changing the tires of, of vehicles and things like that. The actual sensitive thing will always be handled by Russians. So Americans are, uh, whereas today, the Americans have promised us platforms for defense equipment. The F-21, which is a, a pretty advanced model, where Pakistan is concerned, frankly, extremely advanced model, they have promised us that. They have promised to move these plans. They have made India a significant major defense partner of the United States. But all that is contingent on the fact that we do not deepen our relationship with Russia for another generation. That we start making the transition from Russian critical uh, platforms to US or allied, like Israeli, French, etc. And best of all, our own critical defense platform. Which is why buying the S-400 is a very bad idea. For a simple reason, you cannot take over POK without the help of the United States. And the United States will not do that without you and them entering into a formal kind of partnership on both sides. Now, we are pretty good at negotiating these partnerships, if I may say so. Leave this LSA, for example, you know, logistics supply agreement, which they have signed with so many countries in the world. We call it LIMOA. It's not just a change in name. You know, under LSA, the country signing the LSA has no discretion in telling the Americans, sorry, we won't help you on this particular uh, war. You know, if the Americans say we are fighting China or Iran or Russia or Sri Lanka, or whatever, you have to give them facilities. We refused. We, we have made it very, very clear that we will only sign an agreement in which we decide as a sovereign power which countries you are going to war with, we will help you. Which some other countries where you are going to war with, we will not help you. Eleven years, the, the, the amendments made by India remained in the Pentagon, in the White House, in the National Security Council. I mean, I visit America quite a lot. I visit China quite a lot. And I, I must say, confess that I visit the Pentagon quite a lot. I visit uh, you know, similar facilities in China quite a lot. These are two countries I know very well, I like very well. But I'd like to point out that for 11 years, the conditions that we, we said, which is basically that, look, we will decide when to actualize this and not, and not you. So certain countries, we will not allow you to use our territory to go to war with certain countries. 11 years they refused. Finally, they sent back the, the, the Limoa exactly on the same lines as our amendments. So after 11 years, they accepted our amendments. On the last agreement, which is now BECA, Communication Safety, again, we have sent back some five or six amendments. For the last four years, they have been going back and forth, no, no, no. My expectation is that they have more or less agreed, like in the case of Limoa, and they have they are coming back and they are accepting our amendments because there are certain areas where we can't allow them to enter, such as certain you know, developments in our space program, certain developments in our uh, atomic program. I mean, Arvind knows that uh, you know, much, much more than I do, and some of his friends in ISRO and, and Atomic Energy Commission know it even more. But we could not accept that. And so we sent certain uh, amendments there, which I believe if, I, from, if, if my friends in Washington are correct, the Americans said, okay, guys, we'll, 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 we'll agree. So, I, so that, I think, is going to be signed very soon. So assuming we get out of the S-400 trap, assuming we sign BECA, uh, a modified BECA, I believe that we are going to be in a very strong position because I can assure you, judging by my visiting, the Donald Trump, it was a, you know, I mean, Donald Trump is a very smart president. You know, he's called all kinds of names by the media because he doesn't like the media and he makes it very obvious that he doesn't like the media. But the fact is, the man has 
is a very smart and shrewd business guy. You don't keep your billions in a fiercely competitive market in the US unless you're a very smart guy. And this guy is a very smart guy. So from the point of view of this Afghanistan talks, it was, you know, Mr. Zalme Khalilzad. I have written that Khalilzad is a useful idiot of GHQ Rahul Pindi. You know, he's the US ambassador. This is there in writing. A useful idiot is somebody who doesn't know that you're working for a foreign country. The foreign country makes you believe you're working for your own country, when actually you're working 100% for that foreign country. That's why he's useful to that foreign country. He's also an idiot for believing he's working for his country when he's working for the foreign country. Poor old Zalme Zal is a useful idiot of the Wahhabi lobby. There's a very powerful Wahhabi lobby. And recently that Wahhabi lobby was fully activated against Mohammed bin Salman. Now, I don't know the circumstances of what happened about this gentleman. All I know is that Mr. Khashoggi was active in regime change. He was you know, being supported by certain members of the Saudi royal family who were against Mohammed bin Salman and who wanted him to be removed. And he used to go around giving some pretty nasty and I'm sure false information about uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. I'd like to believe that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is a very saintly person. He has none of the you know, evil habits that Mr. Khashoggi has been accusing him of and passing off fake CDs and fake videos and all kinds of fake material and all that. But the fact is, in Saudi Arabia, if you try and remove the crown prince and you try and remove the king of Saudi Arabia, quite frankly, there is only one standard operating procedure. And that standard operating procedure, I'm sorry to say, is that the population of the globe gets reduced by one person. Now, how it happened, I think, is testimony to the complete clumsiness and idiocy of the Saudi security services. They did it in the worst possible way, if they did it at all. I am again repeating that I don't believe Mohammed bin Salman had anything to do with it. I believe Mohammed bin Salman is a man of peace and he would never harm even a fly. He is such a noble person. But whoever did it made a complete hash of it. But the reality is, this man is now fighting Wahhabism. He is the first Al Saud in 300 years to go against Wahhabism. Today, you have ladies in Saudi Arabia go around the way you guys are dressed. And they are not beaten up and killed. They are not threatened with death. Their families are not sent to jail. That's a big plus. Today, you know, you have uh, people who do uh, prayers. The Hindus, Christians, in their homes, they're not suddenly afraid that the door will be burst open. People are going to come, they're going to be beaten up, they're going to be tossed into jail for years. They're not afraid of that. They're doing this now. Now, men and women go together. What a strange thing. I mean, you know, in Saudi Arabia, the last time I went there, it was before Mohammed bin Salman. I can assure you, no man and no woman went together during that time. The women followed a very respectful distance behind the, 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 the men. And I mean, you know, some of you here know my, one of the reasons why I am extremely friendly, uh, close. I have great admiration for Iran. <laughs> I'm not going to say that in front of you, but sometime privately maybe I'll say one of the reasons why. But it's not politically correct to say why I'm one of the great friends of Iran. But I, well, let me say that. In Iran, the lady is not expected to speak unless the husband gives her permission to speak. So my wife loves Iran. I love Iran, my wife loves Iran, so she comes with me for almost all my visits to Iran. And I, frankly, it's a great thing for me when my wife comes with me because, you know, I think I feel more relaxed, I feel more cheerful, and it's a tremendous morale booster for me when she comes along because after 36 years of marriage, it's as though you're, I mean, you're together, you're, you're one unit, you're not just two units. But in Iran, she can't speak to me on the road unless I give her permission. And naturally, I don't give her permission. <laughs> so, of course, what happens is at the end of the thing, when we go back to our, our room in the guest house, our little suite in the guest house, I think then she has a lot to say after that. And she doesn't hesitate to express her views in a fairly robust manner, if I may say so. But I'm only saying that, you know, I mean, Saudi Arabia was, was something like that. And Iran is still something like that. But in Saudi Arabia, there's a change now.
Mohammed bin Salman is that change. So that is a, you know, Trump has been instrumental in going against Wahhabism. Whereas the Wahhabi international is so powerful, including in the United States, UK, etc. Uh, recently I named Lindsey Graham, uh, Tom Barak and various others. I mean, Lindsey Graham, Qatar owns Lindsey Graham. Maybe, you know, 10% of Lindsey Graham is still owned by some other people, but 90% of him is owned by Wahhabis in Qatar. If the Wahhabis want him to squeak, he'll squeak. If they want him to sit down, he'll sit down. And therefore, Lindsey Graham is among the four people who have signed a thing against India, because the Wahhabi lobby is desperate to protect the Wahhabi army of Pakistan. It's a very powerful lobby. And that Wahhabi lobby will be completely opposed to POK, I can tell you. Any Indian takeover of POK, that lobby is going to be very, very active. The good news is that President Trump is definitely not a part of that lobby. And that's why I'm delighted, frankly, that he walked away from this totally disastrous uh, uh, you know, the talks with the Taliban and trying to insert the Taliban into Afghanistan. Because if that had happened, that would have been the end of the Afghan government. They would have gone into sabotage. Afghanistan would have gone back to a, the barbaric situation it had in the 1990s when Bill Clinton, who is the actual godfather of the Taliban, the godmother was Robin Rafael, but the godfather was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton installed the Taliban in power in Afghanistan. Donald Trump would have been the second president to make that mistake. Fortunately, Donald Trump is a very shrewd man. He walked out of it. And I'd like to say openly, I salute Donald Trump for that very brave decision fighting the Wahhabi lobby. I'm sure Lindsey Graham and Thomas Barak and all the other guys who are in the pockets of the Wahhabis will be very upset with him. But Donald Trump realized this is against the interests of America. It's against the interests of Afghan people. It's against the interests of India. And he walked away from it. So today you have an America against Wahhabism. Today you have a China which is the closest friend of the Wahhabi army. The Pakistan army cannot survive for six months without support from China. At one time, they used to fool the Americans in giving them billions of dollars. God knows, I mean, how they did it. But I admire the Pakistani army, frankly. <laughs> you know, I really admire them. Now they've gone and tricked the Chinese. And now tens of billions of dollars of Chinese are being poured into Pakistan. And the Chinese are being led by the nose by the Pakistan army the way the Americans were led by the nose for so many decades. The Americans went through a lot of suffering. And it's my prediction, China is going to go through a pretty bad time because of the strategic error that it has done in trusting the Wahhabi army. Because today I can tell you, China and the United States are not popular in Pakistan. Why? Because they support the army. And the army is no longer popular in Pakistan. The people of Pakistan know that the army is against their interests. The people of Pakistan know that the army people are exploiting them, taking money from them, and basically becoming millionaires and, and multi-millionaires and homes all over the world. Indians, on the other hand, are very... The Pakistani, if, you, if you're an Indian, and if, I mean, if I meet, let's say, a Pakistani uh, taxi driver in New York, for example, or in London, he doesn't take money from me because some of them have read my articles and they know I hate the army. And because I hate the army, they love me and they won't allow me to pay. So I can save $20, $30, $10, pounds, £15 pounds, because taxis are pretty expensive. So I always hope that I come across a Pakistani driver, you know, whenever I'm in London or New York. Because I don't, I, many of them, they just say, look, we know you don't like the army. We don't like the army. We want peace with India. And I'm not going to take money from you, for God's sake, you know. And of course, I mean, I do protest a little bit, but then I say, okay, in the interest of peace and goodwill, I won't pay you the money, you know. I mean, I will do almost anything for peace and goodwill, you know, including, I mean, accepting a free cab ride. But all I want to say is that, frankly, the one worry that, you know, all these, you'll see the nuclear option, the nuclear button. That the whole thing, if we go into POK, the Pakistan army will go nuclear. It is never going to happen. For the simple reason, POK is not an existential issue for Pakistan. Frankly, it, there, there are, it is not an existential issue for Pakistan, the Pakistan army. The Pakistan army knows if it does a first strike on India, 
there are some 46 locations in Pakistan that will be the subject of a nuclear attack by India. The Pakistan army knows that with its frankly limited nuclear capacities, India will for about 10 to 15 years go through a bad time. Uh, the worst case scenario, Germany, Japan, they recovered in seven to eight years. Let's say 10 to 15 years, but we will come back to roaring life at the end of that period. Maybe th most likely given the kind of things that I know about the Pakistan deterrent, not even three or four years, but some parts will be badly devastated. Some other, most of the country will go on. Maybe three or four years, maybe 10 to 15 years at the most, we will come back, back into the major power, global power, superpower rank. Pakistan as a country will cease to exist. And if Pakistan ceases to exist, the Pakistan army, needless to say, ceases to exist. When you're a parasite, if your host dies, the parasite dies. It's, you know, it's very clear. The host is Pakistan for the Pakistan army. And if the host dies, there's no parasite left. So I don't believe the Pakistan army is going to go into a situation where it's going to launch a nuclear attack on India. So these conditions, one, United States uh, strongly with us, Afghanistan strongly with us, and now that this uh, Taliban has been kept away from Kabul, that chance is now much bigger. Iran has to be friendly. Mistakes like not buying oil from Iran have to be, and you have to tell Trump, you know, Donald Trump, you may be right, what, 90, 999 times out of 1,000, but there is one, one out of 1,000, you're wrong, and that was telling India not to buy oil from Iran. So this is that one in 999 in a thousand times that you are wrong. So we're going to buy oil from Iran because frankly, we need the goodwill of Iran. We need the goodwill of Iran, whether it's for POK, for stability, for various other reasons, because we cannot get involved in this conflict between Wahhabis and Shias in which regrettably the United States has got involved. The United States is now openly taking the Wahhabi side against the Shia. It's not taking the Sunni side. The Sunnis are peace-loving people. And if I may say so, Islam as a religion is an extremely peace-loving religion. If you read the Holy Quran, if you read the Mahabharata, if you read the Torah, if you read the Bible, there are several scenes of bloodshed and war in all of them. It's also there in the Holy Quran. But nobody says the Christians, the Hindus and the Jews are particularly bloodthirsty. But unfortunately, in the case of the Muslim uh, uh, you know, uh, people, the Wahhabis have said, we are the only true Muslims. And they are definitely, I'm sorry to say, they are definitely extremists. So this is, we cannot confuse Wahhabism with Islam at all. But what I want to say very frankly is that takeover of POK will be extremely beneficial to the people of Pakistan. It will melt down the Pakistan military's influence. It will therefore strengthen finally Pakistan. Of course, we'll face some major problems. And Muzaffarabad, for example, is full of extremists. We'll have to find out how to deal with them. I hope we don't do, I mean, to be frank with you, you know, uh, whenever an army general talks to me about Sadbhavana, I basically want to, I mean, leave the room because the military is not supposed to be trained for Sadbhavana. The military is supposed to be trained to win wars. The military is trained to defeat enemies. And very frankly, the military is supposed to be defeating enemies not through Sadbhavana. There should be NGOs for Sadbhavana. There should be civilian establishment for Sadbhavana. But I don't think that the military it should be involved in Sadbhavana. And if I'm too many, I'm, I'm meeting too many uh, people in uniform who are talking to me about Sadbhavana. And I'm getting a little worried. And I'm beginning to understand why it is after 70 years, we still have a problem in Kashmir. You know, there's too much of Sadbhavana going on by people in, in uniform, if I may say so. And again, I repeat, I'm a person who believes totally in peace, but the military is not geared for peace. And that's something about the US uh, Marine Corps, for example, or the US Army. I think the US Army is very, very clear that it's not meant for Sadbhavana. It's meant to demolish its, uh, you know, whoever its opponents are. Which is why in a conventional war, the US is, once it uses its strike power, it's absolutely ferocious. Of course, after that, Holding on to a territory, it cannot do. But that is where a country like India, our troops are brilliant in holding on to territory. 
uh, we can do it in a much more in a uh, way which is much more friendly to the people of india and let me remind you in kashmir we have never used artillery we have never used aircraft we have never used helicopters we have never used bombs we have never used any of the weapon systems that are traditionally used by russia israel pakistan united states germany france italy you you name it almost every other country we have not because we know how to deal with this kind of situation and that is why we have managed to keep it at bay despite a very vigorous uh, uh, effort to create utter chaos not only in kashmir but in the rest of india so i want to just you know sum this up by saying one it strategically in my view to 19 in 2018 prime minister modi decided the soft line on kashmir is not working you have to go in for a hard line the in that hard line one of the stations on the way will have to be the takeover of pok so now the 370 is there in my view the the train is chugging along towards the takeover of pok and when you have a man like home minister amit shah telling in parliament that we are going to take over pok i would anybody who does not take amit shah seriously uh, is not a very smart man i don't think even if you are so far from delhi i think you will be very clear mr shah is a man to be taken very very seriously and just today i saw on television he said that he would die for taking over pok i hope he does not die because i hope he is there for several decades to come to serve the country but it's clear that he is determined to take over pok and he would not be saying this unless he has the full backing of the man he knows is his boss which is prime minister modi so i just want to say why is important how it can be done and how geopolitically we need to have a cons- construct that can ensure that this is done because essentially i would like to say it will be grave greatly improve our strategic capacities our strategic capabilities it will also demolish the pakistan army's uh, salience in pakistan which would have happened in 1971 72 we, we had had war crimes trials and all we had held on to these 93000 people for time if we had forced them to make concessions which we did never did but it can happen now and very importantly i can tell you india and the united states this partnership we need for three four reasons one china has now slowly achieving mastery over the eurasian landmass the china you know the the belt and road uh, initiative is a brilliant initiative of president xi jinping to ensure the chinese influence spreads across the eurasian landmass the maritime silk road is another very very important initiative to ensure that it spreads in the oceans as well on the land mass the fight is almost hopeless they are now even in europe italy uh, greece uh, many countries are now becoming more and more friendly to china i think or when you go to poland you'll see that due to china is changing a lot because the major investor we need to ensure that the oceans at least our alliance dominates the oceans our alliance dominates space our alliance dominates cyberspace for this to take place our, our alliance dominates undersea that is not the surface of the ocean but undersea for all this america can't do it alone india can cannot do it alone but the two of us together can do it and we need to do it so from that point of view it's a very very important thing besides the obvious fact that like in 1971 the indo soviet deal protected india from china and the united states uh, india us defense deal will protect india from the chinese uh, effort to help pakistan i don't believe the chinese will do it if the americans are there and also we are very very clear that they will lose their market because essentially the chinese are a very very sensible people and president xi is especially in uh, president xi understand the importance of india the first visit that is being made by president xi outside his country <clears throat> after the 70th uh, anniversary of the founding of the people's republic is to india for the second summit meeting after wuhan it shows the importance that india has for the chinese and therefore i am confident we can do it given the right geopolitical conditions you you guys are here 
to learn geopolitics, to learn strategy, and because in a sense, you're pilots navigating strategy, navigating tactics, <clears throat> avoiding bad solutions, going in for good solutions, because these tactics and these strategies are what will decide whether India remains a backwater or becomes a superpower. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for a very comprehensive lecture and you have covered a wide gamut of areas and why the integration of Pakistan occupied Kashmir will be important for India. And I am sure that there will be some questions. We have some time around 10 to 15 minutes. When is your next meeting? 2.30 if I am right. So we have some 10 to 15 minutes. So those of you who have questions, please do ask and uh, identify yourself. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Arushi Singh. I'm from first year. So my question was, we want help from US and Israel, but we must also maintain good relation with Iran. Now, these countries being enemies or having very diverse interests, so how must we maintain good relations with both or how can we strike a good balance? My second question was, if we participate in BRI, could we have leverage uh, with China in uh, POK? Thank you, sir. Uh, these are very good questions. Thank you. And first of all, Iran. It's in the interest of the United States that we don't lose Chabahar. We are a friendly country. China is not a friendly country to the United States. Today, there is a clear race between the Chinese system and the American system. There was a race between the Soviet system and the American system. Now it's between the Chinese system and the American system. And the success of China is leading to, even in the democracies, people preferring strong, authoritarian, powerful leaders. One of the reasons for that is the fact that China has done so exceptionally well under a very authoritarian structure. So people across the democratic world are saying, we need strong leaders. So that change has come. So imagine if China becomes number one, the American soft power will start melting and Chinese soft power will start rising incredibly. So would America like to lose Chabahar to China? No. Would, would America want to have at least one country who is a close ally, who is friendly to Iran, so there can be some approach to Iran? Remember, Trump is ready to meet Rouhani now. Don't forget that. Yes, obviously. So it's in the American interest that India keep Chabahar. This is the argument I use with my American friends. And I'd like to say that very privately, and some of them send me private emails, which of course I'm going to keep private. They admit that, yes, you're right. You know, India being friendly to Iran makes sense for the United States. So far as the BRI is concerned, look, our problem with the CPEC, which is part of BRI, it's called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It passes through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Now, if we accept that, that CPEC, and we participate in the BRI, which includes CPEC, we are accepting that Pakistan, that Kashmir is part of Pakistan. If the Chinese had called it CKEC, China-Kashmir Economic Corridor, the part, part passing through POK, and then when it crosses the international boundary, CPEC, that's a different matter. But when you call something passing through our territory, Pakistan economic corridor, you are legitimizing Pakistan. And therefore, for that, for that reason, we can't do it. So hopefully the Chinese will understand that and they will change their nomenclature. In any case, I believe that we are working with the Chinese on the eastern side for road projects, etc., on the eastern side. But even on the western side, the nomenclature is important. So long as Pakistan-occupied Kashmir is considered part of the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor, there is no way we can support it. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Vineet Vadaukar. I'm a second-year master's student. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one was, sir, uh, you said that India's economy could be a trump card to use against China. Sir, but if China could go on a trade war against USA, how do you think we could leverage our three tr barely three trillion dollar economy against China? And my second question is that how can we ensure US support in terms of retaking POK when, especially now that the talks with Taliban have failed and, we, and US needs Pakistan supports for their troop survival and withdrawal? Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, the first thing regarding the trade war, the trade war is what has created a much bigger opportunity for India. Don't forget, 
Our trade deficit with China is about 55 to 60 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. The Huawei, for example, the Indian market is crucial for Huawei. At a time when the American market is closed, large segments of the American mar of the U European market are closed. It's very important because the Chinese have a very strong grip over the tele over the uh, mobile market uh, in, in in India. So there are key markets that are very important for China in India, including for a lot of, which I am unhappy about, a lot of low tech goods coming in from China. In my personal view, through Nepal or smuggled or whatever, this is a big, big mistake. We are talking of $60 billion deficit. I think it's closer to about uh, 75 or 80, because about 15 to $20 billion is just not recorded. It comes in through smuggling. So, you know, we do have an enormous amount of leverage caused by the trade war. And yes, we are only a three trillion economy, but hopefully the Chidambaram policies will be removed now that Mr. Chidambaram is having government hospitality. He's got free room and board. Uh, hopefully those policies will, will change. And if that happens, I think we will grow much faster and we'll be much more attractive to a market. And the Chinese, I've been to China many times, state-owned enterprises, understand the importance of China, which is why the SOEs are pushing for a pro-India policy, where the Chinese military is still far too close to the Pakistan military, and they keep pushing this anti-India line. So there's a definite divergence in the views of the state-owned enterprises and the Chinese military on policy to India. So I think these are matters that can be leveraged. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, I mean. The second thing you were talking about was Afghanistan, right? The United States and Afghanistan. Look, the United States understands that Pakistan is a long-term enemy. The Pentagon was never in favor of these talks. From what limited knowledge I have of the Pentagon, they were not in favor of the talks. The Wahhabi lobby was pushing for it. The Pentagon was against it. The problem is the Pentagon needs a partner in the region. Now, the Europeans are pretty useless partners. You know, the only thing the Europeans know how to do is to take high salaries and retreat into their bunkers and make sure nobody is even hurt by, by a shaving uh, injury. You know, forget about being killed in combat. That should never happen. But even in shaving, they have been told, please be very careful, don't, you know. They hate to see the sight of blood. The European armies hate to see the sight of blood. So they are absolutely the wrong kind of people to have as allies. They need a strong ally. And frankly, when you're involved in the fight against Wahhabism, it's not just tall talk and pamphlets and you know going on television saying we're going to fight Wahhabism, this thing, that thing. It's boots on the ground. And let me say that there is no better fighting force than the Indian armed forces where it comes to fighting this kind of extremism. So if they are confident of India, being on their side, I think their approach is going to be very different uh, so far as Pakistan is concerned. You understand. Secondly, they have a lot of, I mean, methods of influencing Pakistan. I really don't believe that the Pakistanis can block access to the United States they want. But once we get POK, they don't need Pakistan. They can get access through India. So that's another big reason why they will want to help us through POK. It's, uh, I mean, I, now we have to do it through Iran. They're not very happy about that. But if we do it through POK, they'll be fine with that. So in, uh, if personally, and I'm, you know, there are definitely, in my view, very many voices there. That's why when, you know, when you hear Prime Minister Modi and you hear Amit Shah talking about taking back POK, who's protesting? Forget about Article 370. The Chinese protested. I went to Beijing. I was in Beijing three days ago. I came back the uh, day before yesterday in the morning. Um, I asked the Chinese, you guys are so upset about it. No Muslim country is up upset about it. You know, no Muslim in India is upset about it. How, why are you so upset about it? You know, are you, I mean, you're talking about, oh, Muslims are being badly treated. You're doing bad things about Muslims. Then why is the Muslim word silent about 370? Why are the Muslims of India silent? Because they know this is the two-nation theory. And the two-nation theory means constant fighting between Hindus and Muslims. Pakistan is based on fighting between Hindus and Muslims. 
we cannot allow that disease to come to India. You understand? So therefore, I do believe the Americans will be a very strong ally for us. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Kiran from second year. Uh, my question was, uh, if we need U.S. Uh, to go ahead with the integration of uh, POK, what would be the Russian response to this and how should India handle it since Russia and India have had a history of good ties? So. Look, today's Russia is not the Soviet Union. It's very different. Today's Russia is the best friend of China and a very good friend of Pakistan. Today's America is not the America of those days. It was hostile to India, Nixon's America. It's very friendly to India. And it's negative on Pakistan, negative on China. It's changed a lot. As far as Russia is concerned, I respect the Russian people. I want to say one thing clearly. The Russian people saved the world from Hitler. The Russian people's sacrifices saved the world from Hitler. There are some of the finest human beings on the world are Russian people. Their literature, their writing, their culture is beyond compare. So we cannot cut off from Russia. But they need money. We need not buy arms from them. We can buy their oil. And now, you know, create a pipeline through China, for example, which can reach India which can buy their oil. We can buy their services, other products from Russia. We can invest in Russia. And, you know, as, uh, I mean, as has been said by the Prime Minister, I mean, you know, we, about $20 billion we can do every year, if not more, but not in arms, which will foreclose the option of the United States. You know, we have to be friendly with Russia. We have to give, ensure that the Russian people have a good, have, have Indian money goes to Russia. And, but that need not go only for arms. It can go in other ways. And one of the important ways could be using, uh, you know, the Russian resources, uh, to buying especially oil to India. So I'm not at all calling for, a, you know, going away from Russia, because I can tell you I have immense respect for Russia. And it is a fourth superpower. It doesn't look like it now. But China, India, US and Russia are going to be the four global superpowers in the next 10 to 12 years with a little bit of luck. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Rohan. I'm from first year. So there have been like since the abrogation of Article 370 and all, there were a few legitimate concerns made like during in the parliament, Gulam Nabi Azad made the statement that there will be there is a legitimate concern that the intelligence sources in the valley, which have been crucial in us fighting the separatists and extremists, will dry up. And now, almost a month has, more than a month has passed, and two days ago, the Northern Command, former Northern Command commander, Mr. Uh, Lieutenant General H.S. Panag, even in his article, he mentioned the same thing, that our intelligence sources, the human intelligence sources have dried up. So, in that condition, how do you think, unless, like, if we are not able to fight the terrorists inside our territory, how do you think it's possible to take it further? Uh, sir, my name is Vipa and I am a second year student here. Uh, sir, my question is that jaish e mohammed is actually a double-edged double uh, terror organization where as much as they are responsible for attacks in Pulwama, they have also attempted uh, assassinations on, like, let's say, Parvez Musharraf and all. Uh, so, and what I also got to know is that jaish e mohammed has used the Al-Qaeda network to try and target uh, the Chinese in Xinjiang province as well. So, in such a, a scenario, why is China silent on their presence? And my connecting question to that is that what does Pakistan army gain from resorting to the same strategy on sending proxies across? Uh, because the major concern sh for them should be that they are sharing a border with them. I am Dr. Mukhtar from MIT Um, good afternoon, sir. I'm uh, I'm Kanchi Kanchi Mathur. I'm from second year uh, at the Department of Geopolitics. Um, so, sir, I have two questions for you, um, and they're all both of them hy you know hypothetical questions. If um, India does decide, if it does um, decide to integrate POK. Uh, and wants to go about it. E, how best can India ensure that when it does take that step, 
the international opinion after um, integration of POK, if it does get integrated with India, is more in India's favor rather it being against India's favor. It should, how best can we ensure that it doesn't con start considering India as a power that is going beyond its capacity? I mean, when it comes to world opinion. Um, secondly, when it comes to um, India uh, taking the decision recently of the abrogation of 370, um, even though the decision taken, in my personal opinion, is also correct, could it have been possible that the implementation of that particular decision be done in a way more better manner so that the criticisms that the government is currently facing, all the human rights challenges, all the communication uh, issues that are taking place could have been better addressed. Thank you. Hello, sir. My name is Kripa. I'm a first year student. Sir, I have a question. How can Israel and India's relation help in integrating the POK? Thank yeah, you, sir. So yeah, I mean, as far as Israel is concerned, I mean, I, I mean, I named America, I named Afghanistan, I named Iran. I didn't name Israel. So I don't believe the Israelis should get involved in anything to do with POK. I think the Israelis um, are, I mean, very good friends and they have, they should get involved the way they're always involved. Israel has always been a good friend of India. They've always supplied critical equipment to us. And I'm sure this time also they'll supply critical equipment to us. From that, from that point of view, of course, they'll always be involved. They've been a very good friend in every war that we have fought. And I'm very certain they'll help us in this war also. So far as your assessment of, I don't know about General Panag, what he's saying, but I... All I can say is that there is a very large factory out there that is basically, you know, NGOs, think tanks, etc., uh, conference uh, people on this India-Pakistan conflict, and you know, P. I mean, basically, my point is, I oppose Article 370 because I believe Hindus and Muslims are the same people. It is for me a fundamental uh, belief that Hindus and Muslims are the same people. And I have Hindus and Muslims I've had in my family. And I've, you know, we had two Muslim half-brothers whom we kind of adopted and we lived with them. I, fr frankly, I couldn't make out any difference between them and my, you know, the, our other brothers. I don't think there's any difference. So I don't, I'm, I don't think General Panag is right, frankly. I have my own uh, input into intelligence estimates of what's going on. This has been very, very devastating for the Pakistan army's credibility inside Kashmir. That they have managed to do so little about stopping India from doing this. Nobody expected them to do this. The fact is, there are many Kashmiris, especially young Kashmiris, who have this belief that you can have a free Kashmir. In Hong Kong, you have many young Hong Kong people who have this crazy belief that you can have a free Hong Kong. There are never going to be a Hong Kong free of China. There's never going to be a Kashmir free of India. And if the sooner they understand it, the better it will be for them. So I think that that lesson is now sinking in, which is why the, the relative situation in Kashmir is now very much more peaceful than it was in the past. As far as intelligence sources are concerned, neither General Panag nor myself nor you, we have no access to these sources. But the people who I know in the intelligence community are extremely happy about the, in, you know, the sources they have. And frankly, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You know, the kind of violence and everybody thought the whole thing will fall apart. The whole of Kashmir will burn. There'll be rioting, there'll be this. All over India there'll be nothing, nothing. I don't see it. Where is it, frankly? So I'm sorry, I don't believe that's correct. So far as Jaishe Mohammed is concerned, Jaishe Mohammed wanted to kill Musharraf because Musharraf was in favor of a peace deal with India. Musharraf, as the as the as the general in charge of Pakistan, did a lot to try and promote a peace in India. Luckily, it didn't work because he wanted free movement across the border between India uh, and Pakistan, where the you know certain territories are concerned. But they wanted to kill him because the army people, some of the people in the army who are Wahhabi, wanted to kill him. Don't forget, inside the Pakistan army, there are a very strong Wahhabi force. And they didn't like Musharraf because he's anti-Wahhabi. Only a Wahhabi general who supports Wahhabism will be safe in the Pakistan army. A general like Musharraf, who was not a Wahhabi, uh, would not be safe. You know, and so far as 
you know, China is concerned. I don't think Jaisi Mohammed is doing anything about China. Let me just point about two things. One is the Lal Masjid, you remember. What happened? They attacked Chinese, uh, ch some, you know, Chinese ladies, and they were blasted to bits by the Pakistan army. Now, what happened? Mr. Zakir Naik went around Malaysia attacking Indians, left, right, center, here, there, everywhere. The Malaysian government did nothing about it. I mean, Mr. Mahathir Mohammed never interrupted his uh, afternoon siesta because of anything Zakir Naik. The day he started attacking the Chinese, the poor fellow got into serious trouble. And he may have to be brought back to India. So the reality is that the Chinese have ways of ensuring that none of these organizations do anything against them. And that is why the Chinese are doing what they feel necessary in Xinjiang. And I'll tell you, I have never once written any criticism of the Chinese activity in Xinjiang, because I don't know the situation there. I'm not prepared to, to, to condemn them unless I have some factual evidence, which I don't have now. But I can assure you they have, they have got a clear grip on the Pakistan army. Pakistan army has a clear grip on Jaish e Mohammed and other terror forces. So I don't believe, that, frankly, that the Jaish e Mohammed will dare to do anything against Chinese. Poor Zakir Naik is now realizing abusing a Chinese is not the same thing as abusing an Indian. You know, he, him, his poor man is realizing that. Now, I mean, I, I don't know if he'll start praising the Chinese tomorrow, but I think that's the only way he can remain in Malaysia. So, so far as President Trump is concerned, I mean, you know, he's, I mean, he's himself, you know, and he's very pro-India. He's been pro-India for a long time. You talk about, he's got Indian partners. In fact, one of the ways I found out a lot about his psychology, and in 2015, I came to the conclusion he's going to be President of the United States. I wrote, in, in, we're talking about Pakistan, in Pakistan Observer in July 2015, that Trump is going to be an ex-president. So I started talking to people who have been working with him as business partners for a long time. Many Indians. The second largest market for Trump brand is in India. I don't know if you're aware. Many Indians are working with Trump as his business partners. The largest number of high-level appointments to the judiciary and to the administration made by any U.S. president is President Trump. Apart from the fact that, you know, during the election campaign, uh, I mean, uh, his, his uh, you know, daughter Ivanka uh, used to regularly, you know, went in, during Diwali to a Hindu temple and all that. And Trump had a very big Diwali function, a very big function for Diwali, you know. And I think he has been talking about India every now and then. He has been talking about getting into Kashmir because Lindsey Graham gave him a set of talking points. He just read those talking points. And the last talking point was get involved in Kashmir. And he realized his mistake. He was called a liar by the spokesperson of the External Affairs Ministry. He was called a liar not in so many words by the External Affairs Minister. He never responded back because he knows how important India is to the United States. And he likes India. Frankly, this is a man who likes India. So I would not say President Trump is harmful for India. Somebody like Bernie Sanders, who seems to be buying into the Wahhabi lobby, is, seems to me a little bit more of a problem for us than President Trump. So frankly, sir, I'm not among those who dislike President Trump. Good afternoon, Professor. My name is Sharon, and I'm in the first year. Uh, since uh, you share a background in journalism as well, I. My question was related to narrative building, uh, especially within India and uh, boundaries outside uh, that concerns international uh, media as well, in specific. Because diplomatically, I think we've done uh, quite a commendable job where countries have supported India uh, in terms of uh, abrogation of Article 370. But what's happening within Pakistan and especially Uyghur Muslims as well, I'm sorry to bring it up once again, I think the international me media is quite mute about it, especially in terms of accessibility. They don't have any. And uh, even, you know, forget about uh, Kashmiri Pandits. That's the next thing. Uh, I think that's the most talked about thing in India, at least. Shias in, uh, Shias in Pakistan are suffering a lot. And uh, the international media is quite mum about it. So without having to uh, go into external factors, how does India develop that kind of a capability to 
you know, sort of uh, have an international voice of ours. I think Vyond tried to do that, but uh, it kind of failed. So, what's your opinion? You know, I, we, I, I had a question also from about uh, this so-called international opinion. Frankly, a country of 1.26 billion people, which is now in purchasing power parity time, the third country in the world, frankly, the only opinion that counts is internal. Uh, it doesn't, unfortunately or fortunately, whether it's India or the United States or China, these countries don't need to worry about international opinion, to be very frank with you. And international opinion is not the New York Times, the Washington Post. I remember the 1990s, when the Kashmir was set afire by Mufti Mohammed's decision to release his, to some prisoners, even though the prisoners, the, the the, the terrorists said that they will release his daughter unconditionally. He still got the prisoners released. We, we, you know, we carried that in Sunday Guardian, the front page, uh, Arif Mohammed Khan's interview. Look, they've been, at, they've been after us all, all the time. And I don't know why. I mean, they don't seem to like a fellow democracy. They seem to somehow have some problem with India. But the important thing is to ignore it. Now, in my case, I have a fair amount of trolls, you know. My, my, my on S-400, uh, the entire weapons lobby has been trolling me pretty badly. My habit is basically to just completely ignore it. So personally, I'm not worried about the so-called international opinion. Only one country supported us when we liberated, when, along with the Mukti Bahini Bangladesh. What country was that? Bhutan. No other country supported India. It didn't matter. Mrs. Gandhi went and, and uh, you know, and took care of uh, what happened in Bangladesh. Frankly, let's do our own thing. Let's do what's good for us. Let's not worry about anybody else, you know. Very good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm Mayank. I'm a first year student here. So a lot of foreign policy commentators uh, regard two very important things about Donald Trump. First is that he happens to, um, uh, he happens to represent a, protection, a protectionist way of thinking about the United States' primary concerns. And secondly is that Donald Trump is often uh, clubbed in with uh, leaders such as Bolsonaro, as well as in Europe a lot of right-wing political parties that are rising as a response to uh, uh, concerns over globalization and the protection of indigenous identities and cultures. Uh, so my question f number one is that, so do you think that in a context in where you have a rising China, and you have more and more ecological concerns, and uh, a world economy that's grappling with problems of uh, uh, like uh, trade barriers. Do you think that hi the history books will be as kind to Donald Trump as you are? And uh, secondly, sir, uh, do you think that it's correct academically for us to look at Donald Trump in the same way as we look at Bolsonaro? Look, uh, uh, I'm, I mean, frankly, depends on who writes the history books. You know, Churchill wrote some history books in which he said that he was the one who won the war. Whereas now you've got some very good books on Roosevelt, which show that Churchill was in favor of a lot of harebrained schemes and was Roosevelt who stopped him. So it depends on who writes the books later on in the future. I, am a, I have a very limited degree of intellect. I look at things from a very narrow point of view, what's good for India? Or what's good, what I believe is good for India? Trump is good for India. Frankly, I'm not concerned about uh, Bolsonaro or anything else. I hope Bolsonaro, Frank, Bolsonaro, I'm sure, will welcome 200, 300, 400,000 Indians settling in Brazil if they learn Portuguese. Long back, I had advised the government of India at that time, please teach people Portuguese, because in Brazil, there are no teachers. There are no doctors. There are, there are no people across 90% of the country. At least half a million Indians can work there. And let me go back to the history, 1950s, 1960s, when anybody could go and settle in Britain from the Commonwealth. Nehru made it so difficult to get a passport in India. Mrs. Gandhi made it so difficult to get a passport. Pakistanis got a passport on site. So they went in, in their lakhs to, to England, and we went in a much smaller way because we, we couldn't get a passport. You know, you, you won't believe a time when it was impossible to get a passport, an Indian passport. I don't know if it was Mountbatten who told Nehru, don't give Indians passport, otherwise we'll have half a million Indians landing there every year. But I wish half a million Indians had landed there every year, or one million Indians had landed there every year. It didn't happen. So, as I said, you know, you've asked me some very cosmic questions. You've asked me some questions that are of great import for the world. 
My problem is I have very limited bandwidth in terms of comprehension and understanding and all that. So my bandwidth is limited as far as Trump is concerned. He is good for India. He is not good for China. And he is not good for Pakistan. So my very limited, from that very limited bandwidth, I am assessing Trump. Let me uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank Professor Nalpat for really giving a very comprehensive assessment on a very complicated theme. This theme is not that easy to understand. And the way he linked this whole idea of integrating 370, sorry, integrating uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir with India as a next logical step, certainly, uh, I don't know, the options which you have given really uh, need to be further assessed or elaborated because these are very important things which you have shared with us. Listening to Professor Dalpath has always been a great fascinating learning experience for me in particular. Whenever I have really interacted with him or listened to his lecture, I think he really gives a lot of uh, food for thought. Obviously, we have taken your lunch time, but obviously this particular interaction with him was far more important than the lunch which we already you take on time every day. So please join me in thanking Professor Nalpath. I just want to say I'm really delighted to be here, delighted to find these very, you know, uh, pretty good questions. And I'm very delighted because let me tell you, whether it's the Indian passport or later on some of you move to other passports, it's, I, I hope all of you work together so that, you know, you go to an allied country of India and together we, whatever partnership you, you're helping, I hope that partnership is there with India so that together we can, you know, the, uh, our partnership can grow. I want to say I'm delight always delighted to be here in this class and I hope I can come spend a little more time here. I know, but, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a few, I mean, I'm going to uh, East Asia, uh, then I'm going to Sri Lanka, I'm going to the United States in the next 30 days. So three countries in uh, 30 days. So I have unfortunately a bit of a bad schedule, but I would very much like to come here because it always energizes me to see you guys. And it always makes me confident that, you know, you are not going to make the mistakes we made.